between the years 1841 and 1869, the United States witnessed one of the greatest migration in its history. Over 250,000 people headed west on the California Trail to a land of opportunity, freedom, riches, and adventure. Decisions were made, routes chosen, and supplies bought in preparation for migration west. The farmer family Eastman from Missouri were one of those pioneers that undertook migration to the west and despite them being very comfortably situated in their farm and homeland, decided to go to the Viraltal River Valleys of California. For many days they followed the trail without special incidents and the tracks of wagons giving them an easy guide. They found grass, wood, and water in abundance, and traveling light and unimpeded by others, felt confident that they were gaining upon the train that would undoubtedly overtake them shortly. They crossed several rivers and streams which most of them were fordable, but one or two they found wide and deep, and were compelled to float their wagon across. They saw antelopes and deer, and shot a few forming a welcome addition to their larder, but they were generally shy and kept out of reach, without wandering too far from the track. For two days the Eastmans had been journeying through an entirely different country from that which they had passed. It was almost a barren desert, treeless, with little water. On its hard surface the wagon wheels made scarcely an imprint, and it was with the greatest difficulty that they could take up the trail. The evening of the second day found them still on the road, as they could find no water, without which they could not camp. Before sunset, they had noticed a low fringe along the horizon which looked like timber, and knowing there must be water there, determined to push on and reach it, if possible, before camping for the night. After a weary march, they reached the edge of the desert plain and found a small stream, clear but shallow, and its banks lined with tall cottonwood trees. Here they rested, and their tired animals fully appreciated the cool water and the luxuriant grama grass which abounded. While standing watch, a precaution they never neglected, Edwin, one of the members of the Eastman family, fancied and heard a distant rifle shot. He roused his father and brother, fearing Indians might be near at hand, for they were now in a very dangerous country, and the father declared that he had seen Indians the day previous. But a scout through the cottonwood grove, revealed nothing, and as the sound was very faint and was not repeated, they concluded it was only fancy. They were not again disturbed that night, but at sunrise the Eastmans made a discovery that filled them with dismay. They had lost the trail. This they were convinced was the result of their night journey and the father of the household was confident that they could recover it. But when after several hours spent in a fruitless endeavor to find where it crossed the stream, his son Edwin urged that they should take their own trail back to the point at which it diverged from that of the train. The father refused to do so, declaring that he wasn't a greenhorn to get scared at so small a matter, and that they should push on in southwesterly direction and take his chance of intersecting the trail. He asserting that they must have strayed to the northward of it. Edwin and his brother protested against the proposal of their father, and they finally started on what was destined to be their last day's journey together. A few moments took them out of sight of the cottonwood grove, and but for the aid of the father's pocket compass, they could have had little idea of their direction but by its assistance they traveled steadily in a southwesterly course. The father being confident that they had strayed north of the trail, 
and that by taking this course, they must sooner or later regain it. Until nearly noon they kept steadily on, seeing nothing to indicate that they were near the trail. Just before noon they halted, to rest and feed the animals and prepare a meal for themselves. The morning now had been sultry and they were all sufficiently fatigued to find a brief rest very acceptable. Refreshed by half an hour's rest, they were preparing to start when Edwin's brother who had moved off in advance, suddenly exclaimed, Father's right after all, there are mounted men ahead, it must be the train. Animated by the hope that their solitary wanderings were nearly over and their pearls passed, they pushed ahead urging their animals forward with all possible speed. The distant horsemen were moving parallel to the route of the Eastman's family and apparently had not perceived them, whereupon the Eastman shouted and fired their rifles. A commotion then was visible among the distant horsemen. They halted, wheeled, and a number suddenly galloped towards the Eastmans with the speed of the wind. Edwin's brother who had ridden far ahead swinging his cap and hallooing loudly, suddenly pulled up his horse, and with a cry of terror rode back with its utmost speed. They were not long at a loss to understand the meaning of this proceeding as he neared his warning shout of Indians, Indians but it needed not that to apprise them of their peril. Before he reached them, the advancing horsemen had approached them so near that they could plainly see them instead of the friends they sought. A horde of hideous Indians, naked to the waist, besmeared with war paint in many strange devices, their tall lances waving, their ornaments glittering in the sun. On, on they came, giving vent to the most blood-curdling yells it had ever been their fortune to hear. In this desperate strait, the father alone preserved his coolness. The warlike spirit of the old frontiersman was roused in an instant. With lightning-like rapidity he had unhitched his team, and so disposed them with their horses and the wagon as to form a sort of square. The horses and mules were tied together and to the wagon, thus avoiding the danger of their being stampeded. Inside this square, they placed themselves and leveling their rifles across the backs of their living bulwark, awaited the attack. Edwin's poor mother and wife, terrified almost to the verge of insensibility, compelled to lie down in the bottom of the wagon, and so arranged its cargo as to protect them from any stray shot which might strike it. At first it seemed that the Indians intended to ride them down by sheer force of numbers, which they might easily have done. But the Eastman's determined aspect and the three shining tubes aimed at the Indians, each ready to send forth its leading messenger of death, evidently changed their determination. For before getting within range, their headlong gallop became a moderate lope, then a walk, and they finally halted altogether. A short council followed, during which the Eastman's had an excellent opportunity to observe their foes and arrange their plans for a defense. Father Eastman cautioned them to hold their fire until absolutely certain of their mark, and that if possible but one must fire at a time, as it was of utmost importance to be prepared for a sudden dash. They examined the loading of their rifles and pistols, put on fresh caps, and with widely beating hearts and nerves trained to their utmost tension, awaited the onslaught. Their enemies now seemed to have arrived at some determination, for their consultation was at an end. An old Indian who from his dignified bearing and authoritative manner appeared to be their chief, made a sign with his hand, and spoke a few words in a loud tone. The incessant jabbering which they had kept up from the moment they halted instantly ceased. And one after another, a number of young warriors, perhaps twenty, rode out in single foul upon the prairie. After gaining a distance of about 100 yards from the main body they increased their intervals, separating them to some 50 paces, and then inclining the course so as to form a sort of half circle. They increased their speed, and came on with the evident intention of circling round the Eastmans.
Surround the father mothers. The instant the movement began. I thought they tried blame their ugly pictures. Now boys, he continued. Keep cool and keep your eyes skinned. Don't throw away a shot. And don't fire till I give the word. He then explained the method of this peculiar stratagem of Indian warfare. The 20 picked men were about to ride around them in a circle, at top speed, delivering flights of arrows as they passed, their object being to disconcert the Eastmans and draw their fire, their guns once empty, the main body whom they observed held themselves in readiness, would ride in, and by a sudden dash, end the skirmish by their dead or captivity. The father's warning was delivered, and it was barely concluded before the attacking party were circling round them, uttering their vengeful war cries, and gradually drawing nearer and nearer. Standing back to back, the Eastmans watched every movement, Edwin and his brother expecting every moment to have an opportunity to tumble one or more of the bold riders from their horses, but a few seconds showed them the fertility of this. As they came within range, each Indian disappeared behind the body of his horse, a hand grasping the withers of the horse and a foot just showing above his back, where all that could be seen. Perhaps a painted face would be seen for an instant under the horse's neck, but instantly disappearing, while the hiss of an arrow would tell that the rider had sped the shaft to its mark. The horse all the while going at full gallop, and at no moment could any one of the Eastmans have fired with any chance of hitting an Indian. The horses they could have shot without difficulty, but this was just what their enemies wanted. Could they but induce them to waste their fire upon the horses, they would soon be at their mercy. So with an effort, they restrained their inclination to risk a shot, and watched their movements with a cat-like vigilance of men who knew that their lives were trembling in the balance. Round and round went the circle of the hunt, Flight after flight of arrows whistled past them, or spent their force against the wagon. Still they were unharmed, although their escapes were narrow and incessant. The mules and horses were struck repeatedly, but so tightly were they bound together with leathern thongs, that not even death could separate them. As their tormentors came around for the fifth time, one of the horses stumbled and fell and rolled completely over, pitching his rider headlong upon the prairie. Before he could regain his horse, the father's rifle cracked and the unlucky equestrian rolled prone upon the ground with a bullet in his brain. That's one less, muttered the father grimly. I thought I'd fetch you a painted ferment. Don't fire for your lives, boys, he continued, till I'm loaded. They were the last words he ever uttered. Simultaneously with their utterance came the hiss of an Indian arrow and with a deep groan he sunk to the ground. Terror striking, and with anguished hearts the brothers raised him in their arms. Alas, the deadly aim had been too true. The shaft entering his right eye had penetrated the brain, and they saw at a glance that their dear father was no more. Wrecked by contending emotions, they had almost forgotten their eminent peril. As they turned to confront the foe, they saw that their hesitation had been fatal. The red warriors were upon them like a living tide, and for a few seconds, a wild melee followed. They battled hand to hand with the desperation of fiends, and it was but for an instant, and Edwin's brave brother fell covered with wounds, and his death shriek was still ringing in Edwin's ears, when Edwin received a blow upon the head which stretched him senseless upon the ground. He seemed to experience the sensation of falling from a vast height, then came a sudden shock, and all was blank. Edwin Eastman mentions about his capture in his autobiography, and says, When consciousness returned, I found myself lying on the ground, tied hand and foot with tongues of buffalo hide. I felt very sore and intensely thirsty. I had not quite yet collected my senses, and when my mind reverted to the scenes I had but just passed through, it was with a sickening sense of their horror that made me yearn for insensibility again. If I could only know what had been done with my wife, had she met the same fate as my father and brother? Or was she spared? Spared? And for what? To be subjugated to a captivity even worse than death, perhaps?
It would have been a great relief to have moved even so much as a finger, but being bound so tightly it was impossible to stir, and the thongs had in a great measure impended the circulation, so that as I lay on my back, gazing pathetically at my feet, it seemed as if they were the appendages of another person, and that my tortures had begun by my being deprived of all the parts of my body below my knees. By dint of much turning, I managed to get myself partly on my side, which proved a great relief, besides affording an opportunity to look around me and gain an idea of the state of affairs. Thank you for watching. If you like the video, be sure to click that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to be notified about our latest videos.